Hare Krishna. So this is a quick uh, announcement from the temple, uh, which is something to help and facilitate our devotees to get closer connected to Radha Gopinath Mandir. In uh, today's day and age, uh, looking to the in extent of uh, devotees using WhatsApp and other messages, uh, we have now come up with a uh, e-receptionist concept. That means there is no physical receptionist here. And uh, the idea is that you can send a WhatsApp message anytime, anywhere. And our friendly this e-receptionist, uh, whose name is Vrinda, will help you instantly. There is a dedicated number, which I will just mention to you now. And you'll also see it in, a, in the video. There's a two-minute video. Uh, and also there will be an email which will be sent to you, so don't worry if you've missed the number now. So the number is very easy to remember, it's 7977-108-108. 7977-108-108. Now in this, uh, the, through the WhatsApp message, facilities like temple information, question answers, events, etc. Uh, even if you want to make a donation via WhatsApp, or you want to get connected to a human agent who can explain any specific queries, even that would be through this number. So as I said, the uh, video will cover that, the two minute video, and then later on, uh, email also will be circulated. So please do uh, take advantage of this, uh, because it will really help you um, uh, get much closer and answer all your various questions. So uh, at this stage, we'll start the video. stage we would uh, request uh, His Holiness Radhanath Swami Maharaj to do a, uh, just press the button and formally inaugurate this initiative. I, I warn you that this that this site may get implicated in my technological bad karma. I press this. Please pray to Lord Nursing it. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.
You can do it on my behalf. <laughs> so we, uh, with this blessing from His Holiness Radhana Swami Maharaj, we hope that uh, devotees will be empowered to serve the maximum number of congregation devotees through WhatsApp and social media. Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> You're welcome. grateful, very happy, very honored to be with you. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swami Nityanamani Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pricharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Bhastyatyate Shatarine Banchakalpatarubhyas cha kripa sindhubhya eva cha Patitanam bhavani bhyo vaishnave bhyo namo namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Adhvait Gadadhar Shivasadi Gaur Bhakta Brinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Hari Hare Krishna As I am Saying Srila Prabhupada, sitting on his Vyasasan, presiding over this auspicious celebration of Narasimha Chaturdasi, I'm remembering an event. I was not there, but I saw photos and I heard the recording many times. It was on this day, the appearance day of Lord Narasimha Dev. And the devotees performed a drama for Srila Prabhupada. A drama that took us through the life of Prahlad Maharaj which culminated in the appearance of the Supreme Lord. And the drama was presented to Srila Prabhupada and the devotee community with many, many weeks of practice, rehearsals, and there was great passion in the actors. Hiranyakashipu, it seemed that the actor was actually um, Hiranyakashipu directly manifested in him. <laughs> he was like the star. <laughs> and after the whole drama was complete, Srila Prabhupada was to begin his lecture on Narasimha Chaturdasi. And he began his lecture saying, All glories to Hiranyakashipu. <laughs> <laughs> and then he philosophically explained or gave a purport to his own words. He said, if it was not for Hiranyakashipu, we would never know the glories of Prahlad Maharaj. 
and Lord Narasimhadev would not come to bestow his mercy and blessings upon the world for all time. In the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Sukadev Goswami is speaking to Parikshit and he is telling a narration that Narada Muni gave to Yudhisthira Maharaj. And actually, this is one of the most extensive single stories in the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. Of course, the tenth canto has the story of Krishna's incarnation. But the seventh, almost the entire seventh canto is various aspects of Prahlad's life. Something very interesting about it is Prahlad lived a very long life. When he was five years old, he was coronated as the king and he ruled for a long, long time, far longer than anybody today could possibly live. And it describes the prosperity, the happiness, the safety of the entire kingdom under Prabhupada Maharaja's rule. It was a very peaceful time. But the whole seventh canto, practically, describes mainly just a few months of Prahlad's life, when he was five years old. And during that time, there was nothing but trouble, anguish, persecution, torture, attempts of killing him, blasphemies against him. Sukha, Sukha Dev, Sukha, he's, he's like a parrot, it is described. Everything he speaks is very sweet. <laughs> Why is it that there's hardly anything else about Prahlad in the seventh canto? because Sukadev Goswami was extracting the essence of everything for what is most important for all of our spiritual progress. Mahajano yena kata sabanta. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very strongly um, defending and expounding this particular statement. There's a story when Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had just arrived in Brindaban. He first came to Mathura and he stayed with a Sanodhya Brahman. And this person was from actually a lower caste of Brahmins, where high-level Brahmins, and especially sannyasis, will never take food from their house. That was like the tradition at that time. Lord Chaitanya inquired from him how he had so much love for, for Krishna. And, the, and, and this Brahman was inquiring from Lord Chaitanya that you must be in connection with Madhavendra Puri. Otherwise, this kind of love for Krishna is not possible. Mahaprabhu asked, how do you know Madhavendra Puri? He said, he's my guru. 
when he came to Mathura, he came to my house and, and took the food that I cooked. As they spoke, after some time, he gave um, Balabhadra Bhattacharya, Lord Chaitanya's assistant, some ingredients to cook. Lord Chaitanya said, why, do, why you don't cook? He said, no, no, you are, you are so exalted. It would be an offense and, and, a, and a deviation from tradition for me to cook for you. Lord Chaitanya said, Madhavendra Puri took your food. Mahajano yena gatasa panta. The path of perfection can never be understood or achieved however much we study scriptures. Because there are so many versions and everything's filtered through our um, conditioned mind and intelligence. Cannot be understood by any type of tapasya, austerities, it's only possible by following in the footsteps of the great souls. Lord Chaitanya established this principle. And according to the Vedic literatures and Srimad Bhagavatam, among, there are 12 um, original Mahajans. One is Prahlad Maharaj. Why? We hardly know anything about his life except when he was five years old. It's just a tiny fraction. And it was the hardest time of his life. Prahlad Maharaj can be glorified in so many ways. His own guru, Narada Muni, is glorifying him. Prahlad tells his friends at school that whatever I know, it's because I've heard it from my guru, Narada Muni, when I was in the embryo of my mother. My father went to perform tapasya to conquer the universe. And my mother, she was, she was captured by the devatas. And Narada Muni, he stopped the devatas. Why are you taking this innocent lady? They said, in her womb is the seed, the child of Hiranya Kashipu, the most envious, hateful, violent, powerful tyrant we have ever seen. Narada Muni, he said, the child within her womb is a Mahabhagavat. He's a pure devotee, self-realized soul of the highest state of consciousness. So now what to do? They released her. So Narada Muni personally took her to his, to his hermitage and took care of her until she could return to her home. And he spoke the teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam to her. He taught the absolute truth and how to achieve it. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu described three principles. There's the sadaka, the sadhana, and the sadhya. There's the practitioner, the practice, and the goal of the practice. 
he taught elaborately. But he spoke it in such a way that the little seed embryo within her womb could hear everything he was saying, assimilated it, and never forgot it throughout his life. He was born a Paramahamsa. And Narada Muni, his own guru, who actually gave him the knowledge and bestowed the grace upon him, is taking the greatest happiness, glorifying him. In fact, Narada Muni said, wherever and whenever there is a discussion of pure devotional service, Prahlad Maharaj should be also discussed. I'm remembering I was in a place where Srila Prabhupada was for about 10 days and every morning he was speaking of the teachings Prahlad was giving to his friends. And I remember I was standing up in the back of the temple and so many devotees were falling asleep. <laughs> because devotees were working hard all day. They, you can't blame them. <laughs> but still, Prabhupada comes once every couple of years. And everybody was really, really struggling to stay awake, but still. And Prabhupada was looking around. <laughs> And he just kept speaking. I guess he was speaking to the soul within their <laughs> within our sleeping minds and bodies um, in the mood of Narada Muni. But Narada Muni was in rapt attention in that womb. By the grace of, I mean, Prahlad Maharaj, by the grace of his guru, he was able to to assimilate everything. In the life of Prahlad, as described in the Srimad Bhagavatam, there is a wonderful consistency to learn from. One of, one of the most important qualities of a devotee is to be steady. Matra sparashastakonteya sitos na sukadukada agama payano nityas tams to dikshasvaparada. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells the non-permanent appearance and disappearance of happiness and distress, honor, dishonor, pleasure, pain, victory, deceit, defeat. They come and go, health, disease, all these dualities, like the winter and summer seasons. One must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. What does it mean to tolerate without being disturbed? In one beautiful recording, a professor is asking, but kind of challenging Srila Prabhupada on this subject, because he was a scholar of Hinduism, Sanskrit, he said, I have read Mahabharata, Swamiji. And after Krishna spoke this verse, and he quoted the Sanskrit, after he spoke this verse in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna, we assume he, he learned it. And he was practicing it. But on the battlefield, when his son, Abhimanu, was killed, unfairly 
Arjuna was heartbroken. He cried and he became very angry. Why? How is that tolerating it? Srila Prabhupada explained that it is natural in a family that if your loved one is suffering or dying, you're going to suffer with them. That's natural, even for great souls. But how did he tolerate it? What is Krishna really talking about? He remained steady. His faith, the integrity of his character, his sadhana, his, sadhana, his smadhana, Whatever happened, he was steady. And Prahlad, we read Narada Muni describing his ecstatic symptoms of love for Krishna. And his father, Hiranyakashipu, was actually the most powerful person up to Swarga Loka. In our lifetime, we have seen powerful people, but Hiranyakashipu conquered the entire earth. He, in he conquered all the middle planets of, of the solar system of the universe, he conquered even Swargaloka, the, all of the abodes presided over by Indra. He was sitting on Indra's throne. And it is described that when he raised a single eyebrow in anger, practically the entire universe, as well as the demigods, anyone below Brahma and Shiva trembled in fear. Now, you, that may sound unbelievable to you, but he was unbelievable. <laughs> he really was. Can you imagine that power? Literally, by raising his eyebrow, that has the Shakti to be like an arrow into the heart, causing fear. What to speak of when he shouted harsh words. Sometimes when somebody gets very angry and they shout harshly, it really disturbs and upsets us. If we multiply that by millions and millions of times, we have Hiranyakashipu. Nobody could withstand his anger or his physical strength. And he was also unbelievably intellectual. But he was envious. And he was filled with hate and arrogance. So here is his very charming, peaceful, respectful, polite son, Prahlad. And he's five years old. And his mother decorates him very nicely. And he comes before his father and sits on his father's lap on the throne. Hiranyakashipu asks Prahlad. Actually, Hiranyakashipu, he had emotions too. When he saw his son, his heart melted. He was embracing him. He was smelling his little head and crying tears of, of affection.
somehow or other, he showed love for a devotee. <laughs> Prahlad really, um, such a devotee. And he inquired from Prahlad about just, he wanted to have just child, child talk with his son. You know, even I have seen fathers who are great politicians or great orators, philosophers, but when they have a little son, they just talk like a little boy or a little girl, they giggle with their girls. It's just the nature of parental affection. So Prahlad, tell me, what is, what do you like to learn? And there are beautiful verses from Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> Essentially, Prahlad Maharaj tells his father that because you are misconceiving your body to yourself and you are attached to your arrogant, ignorant sense gratification, you are no better than a person who is living in a deep, dark well where there is no water but only misery. You should leave this place and you should go to Brindaban and take shelter of Krishna. Essentially, he said like that. That's the worst thing he could say. That was such an insult. The background. The dearest person for Hiranyakashipu was his brother, Hiranyaksha. Hiranyaksha was actually as powerful as he was, but... He dedicated his entire life to assisting his elder brother, Hiranyakashipu. And his being older was just a technicality, too. Because <laughs> they were almost born at the same time. <laughs> Hiranyaksha was exploiting Mother Earth. So much so that the earth was submerged in an ocean. And the demigods, the Brahmins, and Lord Brahma prayed. And Vishnu appeared in the form of a boar, Varaha Dev. Keshavadrita Sukha Sarira Jai Jagadisha Hari. So special, how Krishna is all attractive. Because boars are rarely praised. They're wild, dangerous hogs, is what they are, with tusks. And they tear up your crops and they attack people too. Sometimes they kill. They're actually very dangerous. They usually, they like to go to very dirty places too. But when the Lord, Vishnu, appeared as a boar, he was more beautiful than anyone in creation. He had lotus-like eyes. His tusks and his hooves were like boars, but they were all attractive. They melted the sages and, and, and the devotee's heart. Hiranyaksha could not tolerate this. That he, he submerged the earth and now this boar is coming and picking it up. He attacked Varahadev and they had a really good fight. And Varahadev um, just touched him with his hoof and pierced him with his tusk and he was um, he was another way of saying dead is liberated 
because it was the Lord's tusk. Hiranyaksha was already totally against God. He had outlawed yagyas, he had outlawed ashrams and hermitages, he would have his soldiers burn them down. He persecuted anyone who worshipped anyone except him. He was totally arrogant. And here is his greatest ally and his own brother who's killed by his his worst enemy is Vishnu and now Vishnu kills his brother. Hiranyakashipu vowed to drink the blood of Vishnu. (laughs) He's very demoniac. And now his little five-year-old son tells him, Father, you're in Maya. You're in total illusion. You're, You're just ignorant. You should go to Vrindavan and take shelter of Krishna, Vishnu. Can you imagine? For Hiranyakashipu? But what's even more unimaginable is little Prahlad just said it without the slightest reservation simply because it was the truth. (laughs) Because little Prahlad saw the disease of avidya, of ignorance, that was the cause of his father's um, terrorist activities. And he was speaking with compassion. There's a beautiful um, explanation of a verse from the Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat where there were certain people who were coming teaching misleading philosophies and Nityananda Prabhu kicked them in the head. Why would he do that? (laughs) Because he's so merciful that if he's going to do that, then that means Krishna's going to take such notice of this person, somebody who's so forgiving, this person really needs mercy. So actually, Prahlad, the more Hiranyakashipu was chastising Prahlad or displeased with Prahlad, the more Vishnu is going to take notice of him. Actually, it's in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, what I was meant to say, it was Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami who said that, for that purpose. If I'm saying this about someone, how much Krishna will show mercy upon him? Not that he would actually do it. So here is Hiranyakashipu totally, totally insulted by his own son. And there were other people around. And he's on his lap. He took him off his lap. He told the teachers, Sanda Amarka, you teach him. Teach him the culture that I represent. He's my son. He must, he must be my ally. He must inherit my spirit. Sanda and Amarko chastised Prahlad. And here is where Prahlad was just so consistent. This was in many ways at the very heart of his teachings. That all of this education is about 
how to achieve in life. How to achieve. It may be fame, it may be money, it may be power, it may be um, sensory gratification. The process, this is my friend and this is my enemy. A friend is one who helps me to get what I want. And an enemy is someone who stands in my way. And if a friend stands in my way, they become an enemy. That's material consciousness in a very um, concentrated nutshell spoken by a five-year-old boy. Prahlad Maharaj said, I am seeing everyone equally because I see my beloved Lord Vishnu in the heart of every living being. Suradam Sarva This is one of the primary teachings of the whole Srimad Bhagavatam, of the Bhagavad Gita, of the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. To have this vision where we see the presence of our beloved Lord within the heart of everyone. Ishwara Sarva Bhutanam Arjuna Why? Because he is in the heart of everyone. <laughs> it's not an imagination, it's a truth. Wherever there is life, there is the presence of Krishna as the Paramatma. And the Jivatma is Mamaivam So Jivaloke, is a part and parcel, a child of Krishna. Aham Bija Pradapita. So Prahlad is seen in this way. And nothing could distract that steady conviction in him. He was constantly meditating on Krishna. He was constantly chanting the names and glories of Krishna. He was constantly living according to time, place, and circumstances, the most possible compassionate way to anybody and everybody. Whether he was later going to be the most magnanimous, father-like king, or whether he was being thrown in pits of serpents and stabbed by spears by demon, demonic representatives of his father. He was steady. He went to school. He appeared to really learn nicely because he was just so respectful. He never created politics. He was totally against this political kind of maneuvering of the mind. He was focused. What will please my Guru and Krishna? And then the teachers were so proud of him. They brought him to his mother and dressed him up and put nice decorations on him. And here's little Prahlad again, still five years old, comes before his father and his father lifts him to his lap, embraces him. Oh, Prahlad, tell me, what is the best subject of your school? And in so many words, Prahlad Maharaj said, Father, because you cannot control your senses, you cannot understand the goal of life. <laughs> the goal of life is Vishnu, but whether you, whether you, neither by yourself or with the help of others or both, you cannot understand the goal of life is Vishnu because you cannot control your senses. 
Now here, here in Yakashipu, he had pride. He stood for a hundred celestial years without drinking a drop of water, without eating a morsel of food. He was standing on the tips of his toes with his arms raised. Ant hills were built around him. They ate all his flesh. They drank all his blood. He was just a skeleton standing there, but by his powers, he could keep his life force in his bones. Can you imagine doing tapasya like that? And here's his little son saying, you can't control your senses. (laughs) Therefore, you'll never understand the goal of life. Shravana kirtana smarana bandana pada sevana das yede pujana saki jana atmane vedana. My father, the only way you will understand the truth of pure unalloyed devotion to Krishna, the goal of life, is through the nine processes of devotional service, beginning with hearing, chanting, and remembering. Hiranyakashipu, his boy's just on his lap. Could, the courage of Prahlad to say this while sitting, I mean, sitting on the lap of Hiranyakashipu was like being right in the middle of a mountain, a volcanic mountain that's about to erupt. multiplied by one million. (laughs) He's telling his father this, and he's doing it with his hands folded so respectfully and kindly. He was totally humble. There was no arrogance. He wasn't just preaching to his father. With love and forgiveness and compassion in his heart, He's really trying to help his father. And he's completely depending on Krishna. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, I preserve what you have and carry what you lack. And Prahlad was very personification of that. Then, and for those who of you who are falling asleep, <laughs> at least wake up for this for this <laughs> for this one verse. Then Prahlad told Hiranyakashipu that unless you or anyone else bathes your body in the dust of the feet of a pure devotee who has surrendered to Krishna, you will never understand the goal of life. Hiranyakashipu already warned him so many times. (laughs) And now he's sitting on his lap and he's saying like this. Not only is he saying he should surrender to Vishnu, but he's saying he he should take the dust of the feet of anybody who has surrendered to Vishnu and bathe his entire body with it. This was too much. (laughs) Hiranyakashipu lift, push Prahlad off his lap onto the floor and told, told his army, his soldiers, his executioners kill him. He's like a diseased limb on the body. If he's not cut off, if he's not destroyed, then our whole generation of family will be destroyed. By any means possible, kill him. About his own son. Now, I'm saying it with this very nice sound system that sometimes works. (laughs) 
But at that moment, Hiranyakashipu was angry as fire. We cannot imagine how he was screaming these words, kill him. He must be destroyed by any means. Like thunder. And yet, you know, Prahlad, he was totally a well-wisher to his father. <laughs> but this is how he was a well-wisher. There was no envy. There was no fear. There was simply compassion. And we know the stories because most of you are from India, so you have been hearing these stories probably since you were in the womb of your mothers. <laughs> but, but most of you probably have forgotten. <laughs> but you've been reminded so many times. The story of Prahlad is so special because it's a favorite children's story. And it's constantly being discussed by the greatest ascetics, renunciates, scholars, and sages. He was thrown into pits of venomous serpents. Unimaginable. You go to a Govardhan eco village, sometimes you walk around and there's a serpent. And most people get like mm, <laughs> various degrees of just not wanting to go there. Can you imagine being thrown into a pit filled with maybe hundreds of venomous serpents? But Vishnu in the heart of all these serpents, none of them bit little Prahlad. And he had no fear. Bhakti Vinod Thakur sings, Maro Virako Bijo Ichatoha Nityata Saprati Tua Adhika. My beloved Lord Krishna, if you like, you can protect me. Or if you like, you can kill me. I, be I belong to you. I am surrendered to you. I am your eternal servant. You can do anything you like with me because I am yours. Such happiness. How can you disturb the happiness of a person like that? Hiranyakashipu really tried. He had executioners try to stab him, pierce him with tridents and swords. They took him to a high, high cliff and threw him off. And a place called Singhachalam today, in that place they threw him in an ocean and put a mountain on top of him. They held him in a blazing fire. Not just like a little yagya fire, a blazing fire. And they held him there for a long, long time. And he just walked out. They fed him deadly poison. They tried to freeze him to death, to burn him to death. They were really be trying to be creative. Now, the most wonderful thing is not that Prahlad didn't die. Because ultimately everyone dies. The most wonderful thing 
as Prahlad comes to Diksha Swabharata. He was steady. Nothing could shake his faith, his faith in God's mercy. Nothing could shake his compassion, his character. Nothing could make him afraid. <laughs> and the most difficult thing for Hiranyakashipu when he saw all this is even though Hiranyakashipu was screaming at him with thunderous blasphemies and trying to kill him, and Hiranyakashipu himself was about to try to kill him, Prahlad would, n he couldn't get Prahlad to even dislike him. Can you imagine what an insult that was to his ego? At least dislike me for doing this. But Prahlad was always just offering his obeisances <laughs> and being a well-wisher. And he was always chanting that the Lord's names. Nothing would stop him. Hiranyakashipu, seeing this, he was having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Prahlad, he's sitting on his throne. Nobody is, 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 is in any way um, attacking him. He's sitting on his throne with more luxuries than anyone has ever had in the universe below Lord Brahma, with more power. And he is having a nervous breakdown. Sukadev Goswami tells that even though Hiranyakashipu had all wealth, all power, all strength, all health, he was never happy. He was always in anxiety. The reason? Because he couldn't control his senses and his mind. And little Prahlad, he was always happy. Even though he was the victim of everything. Such a state of devotion. Hiranyakashipu was saying to the people around him, because I cannot destroy my son, he will destroy me. Sandana Marka, please, he's just a boy. He's still five years old. This is just a phase of his life. He will pass through it. Just let us take him back to school. Give us some time. They did that, and Prahlad, so respectful, was listening and and serving his teachers nicely. But then one day, when his teachers went out for a, um, a break and the children were in a recess, they all gathered around Prahlad and asked, why are you so different than us? <laughs> because you have, you're living in the same environment for us. Where did you get this kind of um, information? And Prahlad's he spoke to his little five-year-old classmates. Such a philosophy that was understood by every single one of his classmates, and yet it's considered such a high, profound philosophy throughout the ages. Komara Acharit Prakyo. He begins, now that you're little children, this is the time to dedicate our hearts, our lives, 
to Krishna. And he explained the nature of the world. So many uncertainties and so many distractions. Nobody knows in this world when they are going to die. But one thing that is 100% certain is we will die. And another thing that's 100% certain is it could be at any moment. Srila Prabhupada would say, Parikshit Maharaj knew he had seven days to live. But there is no one in this world who knows for sure they even have seven minutes. Padam padam yadvi padam natesha. And he's telling five-year-old children this. Now is the time. And if you do live, you know, you spend so many years of your life just frivolously playing, and then you spend so many years of your life studying and studying and studying and then you and then working and working and working and supporting families and then you spend so many years by the time you know all that is is beginning to be complete where you have your children and you have your grandchildren and everything's established and you start getting old and your mind is not working so well and your eyes are not seeing so well and your ears aren't hearing very well and then you waste your life with other distractions. So it really doesn't matter how long you live. It doesn't matter what is your age. Now is the time. Prabhat saying. And he gave so many beautiful teachings. And his children believed him. Because Prahlad cared about them so much. They understood he is our dear most friend. And he, had, he made every one of his class devotees. They were chanting the holy names of the Lord. And when Sanda and Amarka came back from their recess and saw what Prahlad did, they were in great fear. They did not want to be blamed for this. So instead of being blamed for it by Hiranyakashipu finding out for himself what happened to the whole school, they brought Prahlad and it's not our fault, it's his fault. <laughs> That's what they did. Hiranyakashipu was so angry, so disturbed, so outraged. His eyes were like burning coals. His limbs, his mighty, powerful limbs were trembling in fury. He drew his sword. And what kind of a sword? We cannot, we cannot even picture this kind of sword of Hiranyakashipu. Because he was so strong. His arms were so huge and powerful. His sword... like a thunderbolt. And he said to Prahlad, he screamed at Prahlad, how dare you defy me? What and who gives you the power to defy me? I am supreme. Where do you get such power? Prahlad, so respectfully. It wasn't like a debate. It wasn't like Hiranyakashipu. He was shouting. The universe was shaking practically as he was shouting at Prahlad. And Prahlad is just very gently and sweetly replying, My father, oh best of demons. <laughs> I am, my, I am getting my power from the same place that you're getting your power, from Vishnu, <laughs> from the supreme beloved Lord of our hearts. 
Hiranyakashipu was trembling more. You speak about this Vishnu, how dare you say what you're speaking? Where is your Vishnu? Where is he? Prahlad said, Father, he's everywhere, and he's in everyone. Is he here? Is he there? Is he up there? And then Hiranyakashipu pointed to one of the royal pillars close to his throne and said, Is he in this pillar? It's just a piece of stone. Prahlad said, Yes, he's also in the pillar. <laughs> Hiranyaka, you're laughing, but Hiranyaka, at least <laughs> a few of you are laughing. <laughs> Hiranyakashipu was so outraged. He said, then let us see if he will save you. He took his fist his mighty fist and with great force he smashed the pillar drew his sword and attacked Prahlad to kill him little Prahlad even when he was offered the most deadly poison he just offered it to Vishnu and then ate it and everything was all right and now his father, in the summit of his anger, with his sword raised, is rushing to Prahlad to kill him. Did Prahlad run away? Did Prahlad say, oh, actually, father, I didn't mean it. <laughs> Somebody... Prahlad was standing there with his eyes glowing with compassion for his father. And at that moment, the pillar began to tremble. And this extraordinary sound was emanating from a pillar. Have you ever seen such a thing? This, this sound that no one in the universe has ever heard before, loudly coming out of a stone pillar? It was shocking. So shocking, Hiranyakashipu stopped and looked at the pillar and was thinking, where is that sound? It was like a screeching sound. Where is it coming from? It started becoming like a roar from the pillar. The Supreme Personality of Godhead manifested. <laughs> to protect his beloved devotee, Lord Brahma, who gave a benediction to Hiranyakashi, that you will not be killed by anybody Brahma said, you will not be killed by anybody that I have created. And Brahma creates every single species of life in the universe. So that seemed like a good insurance policy for <laughs> Hiranyakashipu. You will not be... Hiranyakashipu was actually asking for those benedictions. I will not be killed by anyone who you have created. Neither man, animal, fish, bird, anything. Or even the demigods. I will not be killed in day or night. On the land, in the water, in the sky. I will not be killed by any type of weapon. Hiranyakashipu was so thorough. He wanted to cheat 
Vishnu. He wanted to cheat time itself. He asked for the benediction that, that up to Brahma's abode, he would be undefeated, victorious champion, conquer everyone and control everyone. That he would have all the mystic cities of power, yogic powers. And Brahma gave him everything. And Lord Vishnu, Shiva Prabhupada would sometimes say that you might be able to cheat the people of this world, but you cannot cheat Krishna. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells that he is the greatest cheat. He is Hari. He knows exactly. So out from the pillar came this form, half man and half lion. Enormous in size. Such an effulgence emanating from his body. There's a wonderful description of Lord Nadarsingha Dave in the Srimad Bhagavatam. He was the personification of God's anger. It's, it's unimaginable. We know how much somebody's anger or a mob's anger can cause a disruption in this world. But here is God, the absolute truth. His total anger is being personified in this form, and he is roaring. Prahlad's watching. <laughs> Hiranyakashipu is just amazed. But his arrogance was so great. Still, he is thinking that no one has ever conquered me, and I have my benedictions. No one can ever conquer me. Maybe this is my enemy Vishnu, and today I will kill him. He drew his sword and he ran right in, right toward Narasingadev. And there was a very good battle. Sometimes Lord Narasingadev captured him. And Hiranyakashipu, with clubs and swords and weapons and mysticism, he would fight and fight. Sometimes he would slip out of Narasingadev's paws. He would go into the air and attack. And he was thinking, because he cannot hold me, that means I am more powerful than him. He played, Narasingadev played with Hiranyakashipu as a large cat plays with a tiny mouse. Sometimes lets the mouse go just because it's more fun to catch it again. <laughs> and the battle went on for, for some time and, and the devotees and the sages and the rishis and the devas they were so afraid of Hiranyakashipu. They were praying and begging, Lord, please, end this. But the Lord kept playing with him like this in the form of battle until the sun set so he could honor Lord Brahma. Then he caught he caught Hiranyakashipu. And right at the doorway, neither inside or outside, 
as just at the sunset when it was neither day or night, he put Hiranyakashipu on his lap. And he was neither a lion nor a man, yet at the same time he was both a lion and a man. And he was not created. <laughs> Narasimha Dave, in tumultuous anger, he roared, and with his nails, he ripped open Hiranyakashipu. Now, this is one of the most enchanting parts of the story. Just so that everyone would know that Hiranyakashipu would not bother them anymore. Lord Narasimhadev, he pulled out his intestines. And Hiranyakashipu was very big, so the intestines were huge. <laughs> he pulled out his intestines, and blood was dripping and flooding everywhere. And the Lord placed like a garland of victory. The amazing thing, it looked so aesthetically sweet, beautiful to the devotees. Because what's beautiful and what's ugly? <laughs> we have our um, interpretations and our perspectives. But in relationship to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he's all beautiful. And when he puts intestines on him, it's not just ghastly, it's beautifully, sweetly, irresistibly ghastly. <laughs> That's called achintya. It's inconceivable. Krishna is simply all attractive, whatever he does, when we love him. But for all the soldiers and armies of Hiranyakashipu, they didn't see it as something very beautiful. They attacked Lord Narsingha Dev. But Lord Narsingha, here is Hiranyakashipu, dead on his lap. Narasimha Dev throws him off his lap like a piece of trash onto the floor. As one treats a devotee, that's how Krishna will reciprocate and treat you. It's very interesting because we spoke about so many instances where Hiranyakashipu, in his hatred toward his own son, he would throw him off his lap. When he wanted to get him killed, he threw him off his lap. And now here is Narasimha Dev throwing Hiranyakashipu off his lap. Prahlad, he was asked by Lord Brahma to pacify the anger of Hiranyakashipu, I mean of Narasimha Dev. All the Brahmins and even Lakshmi could not pacify him. He was so angry at Hiranyakashipu's, not only his, his atrocities to humanity, to, to, to dharmic culture, but what he did to his little son, the devotee Prahlad, the personification of God's anger in its fullest was there in Narasimha Dev. And now Brahma told little Prahlad, he's done this for you, you please make him peaceful. 
And little Prahlad did what nobody else dared to do. The five-year-old child, he walks right up to the gigantic form of the trembling Narasimha Dev. And he offers his prostrated obeisances and stands with his folded palms, as we see in so many of the deities of Prahlad and Narasimha. And being so attracted, Narasimha Dev placed his hand on Prahlad's head. And by touching Prahlad, at that moment, Lord Narasimha Dev became the personification of peace, tranquility. <laughs> and all of the loving attributes that we recognize in God. The most wonderful part of this wonderful Leela is Lord Narasimha Dev offering benedictions to Prahlad. Prahlad's entire chapter of wonderful prayers of pure unalloyed love and devotion. Narasimha Dev, you have suffered so much for me. I'll give you anything that you like. Anything, everything. Prahlad's response, My beloved Lord, if I ask anything from you, then I'm not a devotee. I'm just doing business with you. I don't want anything from you, eternally. I only want to serve you and please you. That was Prahlad. Narasimha Dev was very insistent that Prahlad ask for something. Prahlad, he asked, let me always remember you and always aspire to be the servant, the servant of your servants and the association of your devotees. I was suffering in a pit of snakes and my guru Narada Muni came to save me. How can I want anything else but to serve my, to serve him? That's all he asked for. To always remember the Lord and be the servant of the servant of the servant of the Lord. And as far as my father, he has committed so much terrible karma, so much violence toward everyone, murders, um, tortures, exploitation. Please, free my father from all karma. Give him liberation. Such forgiveness. He's begging, if you want to give me any benediction, my Lord, after everything Prahlad went through, the only thing I'd ask is give my father liberation. And Prahlad said, as far as me, I don't want liberation. I don't want wealth. I don't want power. I don't want sensual enjoyment. I don't want yogic powers. I don't want even liberation. My desire is let me continue to take birth in this material world of suffering 
so that I can help others to find the joys of loving service to you. As long as any fool or rascal may be in this world, let me be there to help them to love you. Narasingadev gave him every kind of benediction. <laughs> that not only will your father be liberated, but all your generations of, of, of ancestors and forefathers will be, and mothers will be liberated. And Narasingadev requested, he ordered Prahlad become the king. Five years old. How would you like to be a king at five years old? Prahlad, whatever you like, my lord, I'll, <laughs> I'll be the king if you want. <laughs> I don't want anything. But So Lord, lord Nursinga gave benedictions and he, he, he departed he stopped in Mayapur Dham, Navadweep at Godram Weep for some time to rest. There were a few places he stopped actually, which are very holy. And Prahlad was made the king. We don't hear much about him being king. But it was just that that time reference when he was in such crisis. Why is this so important to focus on? Lord Brahma himself, in his prayers to Krishna, one of the favorite verses that Srila Prabhupada and all of our acharyas would recite. Who is the rightful heir to the highest liberation of love of God? One who even in crisis and difficulty, with a grateful and humble heart, offers obeisances to the Lord, remembering the Lord, Seeking shelter of the Lord. So this is the first time I've been here sitting in this place, in this temple with all of you for two years and two months. Because of pandemic, this coronavirus and and some of our dear most loved ones in our in our devotional family have suffered have been taken by krishna during these this time so very heartbreaking And there's so much conflict and uncertainty, whether it's climate changes. Just I was told by one wonderful devotee yesterday that in the month of March, there was a heat wave that made it more hot than the month of May in, Mum, in Bombay. May in Bombay. <laughs> Sometimes I encourage myself with like that <laughs> by, by, by making a fool of myself. And so much conflict, war, suffering, economic uncertainty, uncertainty in almost every aspect of life potential nuclear battles. We just don't, everything is so close to catastrophe. 
just a few crazy people pushing some buttons and there's massive <laughs> nuclear bombs dropping everywhere. And so much division, so much division and, 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 and hatred and distrust based on political views, ideologies, fears. These are all the natural symptoms of Kali Yuga, an age of quarrel, strife, and hypocrisy. So the example of Prahlad is so important. That is why Narada Muni said when, when, when great souls speak, they, they also include topics of Prahlad. on the path to Vrindavan. It's so important. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna, tasting the sweetness of the supreme love of Srimati Radharani and sharing that love with the world through the Harinam Sankirtan movement. Lord Chaitanya is Radha and Krishna in one form. And in Jagannath Puri, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was tasting the ecstasies of the deepest sweetness of Radha's love during Rati Yatra. He's in the mood of Srimati Radharani when she's meeting Krishna in Kurukshetra and begging and pleading for him to return to Vrindavan. When he's in the Gambira, he's often in the mood of Srimati Radharani. When Uddhava came to Vrindavan with Krishna's message, and the love and separation that Sri Radharani exhibited at that time was the highest revelation of spiritual ecstasy. That's Lord Chaitanya. And every day, he would go to the Tota Gopinath temple to discuss Srimad Bhagavatam with Gadadhar Pandit. And who is Gadadhar Pandit? Srimati Radharani's expanded incarnation. What is that discussion between Gadadhar Pandit and Lord Goranga Mahaprabhu at the Tota Gopinath Temple in Puri? As they were, rec as they were reciting and discussing Srimad Bhagavatam, they were both weeping so many tears of ecstatic love that even the, after some time, the text and the palm leaves were being washed away. Vrindavan Das Thakur describes when they would read the section of Prahlad, and it's a large section, it's an entire canto almost. So many chapters. It's not that they would get through Prahlad's, his, his, his youth, the tortures and tormenting that he got from his father, the prayers, the teachings, not a sing a Dave. They'd read through all of it. And it took much longer than my um, overtime lecture tonight. <laughs> I'm sorry. When they completed it, they didn't say, all right, now let's go to the eighth canto. Lord Chaitanya would say, let's read it again. They could not read the story of Prahlad less than 100 times again and again and again before going on to the next chapter. 
Why? They were tasting such sweetness of Prahlad's devotion. And most of all, they're setting a precedent that if we want to enter into the into the leelas of Brindaban, we need to develop these qualities. We must follow in the footsteps Prahlad as preliminary. And in Navadweep, during the highlight of the ecstatic reciprocation between Lord Chaitanya and his innermost core circle of pure devotees, avatars, nityasiddha associates from the spiritual world when they would dance in Srivasangam and it was the same mood and spirit of the Rasa Lila in Brindaban. And Lord Chaitanya one day, he sat on the throne of the Lord and manifested his opulences as the Supreme Personality of Godhead openly and offered any benediction to any devotee. This was such an extraordinary, elevated pastime of loving reciprocation. And Lord Chaitanya called for Haridas Thakur. Lord Chaitanya came to establish the Sankirtan movement and he made Haridas the Namacharya. You are the teacher through your example of the Sankirtan movement. Most exalted. And when Lord Chaitanya called up Haridas, he was he was glorifying Haridas as if he had so many mouths. And he was remembering how Haridas, in every stage of his life, he was being persecuted. When we read Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat and Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, so many of the stories of Haridas Thakur is when somebody's trying to cheat him, someone's trying to kill him, people are, Brahmins are blaspheming him, um, Malachas are beating him. He was beaten in 22 marketplaces for the purpose of execution. He was tortured in so many ways, misunderstood in every way. And yet he was always forgiving and always steady. Tums to Diksha Svabharat. How was he tolerating? He never stopped chanting the holy names of the Lord. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. And Lord Chaitanya was glorifying him. And he said about Haridas, you are Prahlad Maharaj. <laughs> Mahaprabhu, in his opulent form of Mahaprakash, to his greatest devotee, he's remembering all the way back to Satya Yuga, little five-year-old Prahlad. Such an impression. Lord Chaitanya is Narasimha Dev. Millions of years later, he's still remembering Prahlad. And in Jagannath Puri Vasudev Datta, he prayed, My dear Lord, I've never asked anything of you, but I have one desire. And I know you can fulfill it. So if you can fulfill it, please do so. My heart breaks when I see people suffering. Let all the bad karma, all the sins of every living being in this entire universe fall on my head. 
Please, my Lord, allow me to suffer perpetually so that they could be liberated in your loving service. He meant it. Krishna's in everyone's heart. Mahaprabhu is in everyone's heart. He knows our intentions. Lord Chaitanya hearing this type of compassion was so overwhelmed he began to cry. His limbs trembled and his voice was faltered so he could hardly speak. To do that to the Supreme Personality of Godhead? And what was the first thing that came out of Lord Chaitanya's lotus-like mouth at that time? He said to Vasudev Dutt, you are Prahlad. We cannot imitate Prahlad. If we try, we will die. <laughs> you cannot imitate Prahlad. Mahajano yena gatasapata. But it is our foremost duty and the highest blessing that has been bestowed upon humanity that we have this information where we can enshrine within our heart his values, his character, his faith, and how in every situation, easy or difficult, pleasing or painful, he was always taking shelter of Krishna. To follow in his footsteps. Srila Prabhupada is our founder Acharya. And of course, you know, if Krishna, who is the controller of all controllers, Sarveshwara Ishwara, he could have given Srila Prabhupada a first-class seat on an airplane to America in 1965, but he put him on a cargo ship, and it was a really old cargo ship. Years later, when I was once speaking in Detroit at somebody's house, there was someone in the audience who was a captain of the Jaladuta. He wasn't the captain, what was his name, Pandey? He wasn't that captain. But, they, but the Skindia's um, cargo ships, they, would have, they had different captains on the same boat, different trips. He said he sailed the Jaladuta many times. <laughs> and I said, where's the Jaladuta? Because I live in India, and I live in Bombay, actually, so I, is, can I see it? He said, when, when your Srila Prabhupada rode on the Jaladuta, it was already so old that soon after it, it was scrapped, it was just destroyed. So Prabhupada was on this old cargo ship. We think it's so hard to take an airplane and get jet lag and all that stuff. 38 days, heart attacks, seasickness, uncertainties, sometimes during storms and waves in the Arabian Sea, Srila Prabhupada said it felt like the boat was like a little matchbox just being tossed around by the waves in the ocean. And what was his prayer? It was 
Prahlad's spirit of prayer in the mood of the six Goswamis and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. After all, that's, he's coming to America. He's in terribly ill health after heart attacks. He has no money. He doesn't know a single person outside of India. Now he's 10,000 miles away. And he's praying, Krishna, please give me the words so that I could make these people happy. <laughs> That's all he's asking. Give me the words so that they can understand your message and be happy. He was just praying for our happiness. Let me be your puppet and dance according to your wish. We cannot imitate the Mahajans. But this is the aspiration of what we enshrine in the altar of our hearts. This is what is great. This is what, even if we're a million miles away, step by step, this is what I'm going to aspire for. Otherwise, the distractions of this world is we think that beauty and glamour is great, or acquisition of property is great, or scholarship is great, or power and fame is great. There's so many things that people get impressed by. Skill, Being a scientist, being a musician, being an engineer, being an artist, a poet, an author. But Krishna tells us in Gita that whatever greatness you see in this world, it's at the most just a tiny little spark of my greatness. <laughs> to seek shelter of the Lord in the mood of what Srila Prabhupada represents in his prayers, of what Prahlad Maharaj represents in his prayers, which is non-different than what Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu offered in his Shikshastakam prayers. That selfless, unmotivated, uninterrupted, loving service The culmination of the Shikshastakam is, my Lord, if you want, you, you may embrace me, or if you like, you may trample on me, or make me brokenhearted by not being present before me. Please do anything, because I am your servant unconditionally. That's Srimati Radharani's prayer coming from the heart of Lord Chaitanya. This is greatness. In the spiritual world of Vrindavan, it is on a, such a transcendental platform of ecstatic love. But Prahlad brings that spirit down to the material platform in all the dirty situations and distractions that we're living in. And that's why this day, Narasimha Chaturadasi, is so important. Kali Kale Namarope Krishnavatar. That same Narasimha Dev, Lord Sri Ram Chandra, Varaha Dev, Parasuram, Matsya and Kurma, Balaram and Krishna, and Sri Sri Radha Gopinath. They have descended in the transcendental sound vibration of their holy names. And they have descended in the words, in the sound vibration of the Srimad Bhagavatam.
Why? To give us shelter. And how, how do we honestly and actually find shelter in the holy names and in the, and the association of great devotees? We learn from the great souls. So on this very special day and what is the time now? 633. <laughs> I'm only three minutes over time. I'm <laughs> please don't, please don't say I'm five minutes over. <laughs> but it, it will soon be five minutes. I'm sorry. But on this very, very holy day of Narasimha Chaturdasi, mm -hmm. Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he taught us that we should pray to Lord Narasimha Dev to destroy the, the enemies, the demons that are within our heart. Mundane, lust, anger, greed, envy, arrogance, and illusion to remove the obstacles to pure devotional service to Sri Sri Radha Gopinath's loving service. And Srila Prabhupada, he was very concerned always for every level of a devotee, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. He was always very concerned with the health of the devotees. This body that we have is entrusted to us by Krishna. It's Krishna's property. Lord Chaitanya told Sanatran Goswami, you have, you have surrendered to me? That means your body belongs to me. You must take good care of it. Srila Prabhupada, for our physical condition and for other devotees' physical condition, for our emotional condition, and most of all, for our spiritual condition where we find eternal shelter in the Lord's love. Lord Chaitanya taught, I mean, Srila Prabhupada taught us to pray to Lord Nadar Singha Dev. Krishna appeared in this form to remove these obstacles. And in every temple throughout the world, Srila Prabhupada, wherever he installed deities, there were six offerings and six artis. And every time at the end of the kirtan, the chanting of the prayers to nursing a day. So let us pray for the protection of each and every one of our family members, of all of the devotees, of the whole community, of the worldwide community of Vaishnavas, for all humanity, for all living beings, let us pray, Lord Nadasinghe Dev's mercy come upon us so that we can approach the lotus feet of Sri Sri Radha Gopinath with true devotion. Thank you very much.
this is something new that you have been practicing <laughs> in these last two years since I've been <laughs> Um, Srila Prabhupada said that when we clap our hands in front of the deities, the birds of sinful reactions go away. Many, many birds today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please, Srila Prabhupada Kita.